So our next presentation is the key extraction using thermal laser stimulation, a case study on Xilinx ultrascale FPGAs. And this was, was authored by Heiko Lorca, Shahin Tajik, Thilo Krakenfels, Christian Bolt, and Jean-Pierre Seifert. And we'll be presented by both Heiko Lorca and Shahin Tajik. Okay. 600 seats here, so nobody should have to stand. But maybe make sure that if there's an empty space next to you, compress that you have uh, more places for people to get in and actually sit down. There are lots of people in the back who by now probably have sore legs, but there's no reason for that. We have plenty open seats here. OK. Um. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Heiko Lorke. I will give the first part of this talk, and then later Shine will give the second part. And um, we will actually talk about a case study that we did using a technique called thermal laser stimulation to extract keys from FPGAs. And I will first give some background. Um, now, on FPGAs, um, you uh, start the device by configuring it. And if you have implemented something on your FPGA, usually that contains IP or other secrets that you want to hide from an attacker. So um, since the FPGA has to load that data when it boots or when it starts, um, an attacker ca could actually eavesdrop on that communication because it's loaded externally. Um, and the solution to that is bitstream encryption. Um, which is uh, what I will now give you a quick background about. So bitstream encryption works in the following way. You generate a key, and this key is then transferred into the FPGA into some sort of key memory. And um, in the case of the board that we've used, there are two options to save the key, eFuses, which we will not discuss, and BBRAM, which is short for Battery Backup SRAM. So that's a very low-power SRAM that uses a backup battery to keep the key in memory. Um, when the device is powered off. So then you have your key in the FPGA, and then you take your design, which you want to protect. You also encrypt it in the trusted field, and then you put, put this encrypted configuration file into non-volatile memory. And then in the untrusted field, you can start your board. The FPGA will load the data, the encrypted bitstream data, from non-volatile memory, will decrypt it, and then it can use the plain text bitstream to configure itself, and then it will boot your implementation uh, or run your implementation or whatever you want it to uh, put on your FPGA. Now, what we will be looking at is um, this key storage, and we will use thermal laser stimulation, which is a technique which is used in failure analysis usually. And um, thermal laser stimulation works in the following way. So the idea is that you use a laser that has mainly thermal interaction, so in this case 1.3 micrometer wavelength, and you scan the silicon die of your chip in a setup similar to this. So this is the silicon surface, and then you use your laser to um, scan over this device, and this will introduce localized heating into the structures inside the silicon die. Now, at the same time, you have your power supply and you measure your current that is drawn by the power supply. Now, the laser beam will actually influence stuff like your leakage current and similar parameters in your device, and you can then measure that. And if you are sampling uh, uh, and um, this uh, current amplifier generates a voltage signal from the current consumption of your device while you are scanning your device with the laser, so this allows you to uh, later um, use the samples that you have acquired synchronously with the laser scanning process, and then that will give you a 2D map of the reaction uh, of this device to the laser stimulation. And that is what we call a stimulation response map. Now, how can you use this stimulation response map to read out SRAM cells? As I said, the key memory is just a low-power SRAM with a battery backup. Um, for that, we first need to understand how a single transistor behaves under thermal laser stimulation. Now, um, this is a cross-section of a MOSFET transistor. 
um, we are using, in this case, a laser beam to heat the drain uh, as an example of the transistor, and this will create a thermal gradient, and because of the dissimilar materials, you will get an effect that will uh, generate a Seebeck voltage. And if this transistor is on, you have a conducting channel here, and the Seebeck voltage will generate a voltage source here. So you will basically get a voltage source which is connected between drain and source of the transistor in the moment where you hit it with the laser. Now, for an SRAM cell, the basic memory element of an SRAM cell um, is a cross-coupled inverter, which uh, consists of four transistors. And to explain this process on the SRAM cell, I will first start with a simpler example, which is just two inverters. So assume we have a high input here, that means this PMOS transistor is off, and this NMOS transistor is on, and then this will pull this output to ground. But if we shine the laser on this transistor, we will generate a small voltage here, which will influence the output voltage. And this output voltage is connected to the next inverter, and because the output voltage changes, the gate input of these two transistors changes. This transistor is already on. There's not much happening here, but this transistor is off. And now we slightly increase the gate voltage using the thermal laser stimulation. So this means this transistor turns on very slightly. And since we have supply voltage here, already an on transistor here, and now a transistor that is coming on just a little, that is decreasing its, its resistance just a little bit, we get a leakage path from here to ground. So if we hit this transistor, we will see an increase in current consumption or in leakage current. Now, to get an SRAM cell, for, uh, to get a cross-coupled inverter for the memory element of an SRAM cell, you just connect this output to this input, and then you can see that the cell will keep one um, of two states, and that is how you save a bit. And that will then just look like this, so this is basically the same circuit, just um, with the output connected to the input. And this is the situation that I've just explained. If you stimulate this part, you will influence this transistor and get a leakage current here. But because the cell is symmetrical, you will have the same here. If you stimulate this transistor, you influence this output, then you will get a small leakage current through the left side of this uh, cross-coupled inverter. Now, the interesting thing is, um, if, you switch the, uh, if you change the bit in this cell, all transistors will switch their state. So this will mean that these sensitive spots will also switch their position. So if you scan this bit state, uh, this, if you scan this cell with this uh, bit set, you will see if you hit these transistors, you will see an increase in current consumption. And if you grayscale and code your stimulation response map, you would expect something that has like an increased current in the top right and bottom left corner. And these two corners will just not react to the stimulation. But now, if you switch your bit state, uh, all the transistors switch to their inverted state. So this also means that your stimulation response map will change to its inverted state. So if you take a look at the thermal laser stimulation response map, you can, from the pattern, deduce which bits are saved in this memory cell. And um, we then use this to um, read out, uh, we will try the, to, to use this to read out the SRAM memory uh, that stores the key. Now, for our experimental setup, we used an FNAT Kintex ultrascale development board um, the ultrascale FPGA is built in 20 nanometer technology, and as you can see here, it's a flip chip with an exposed silicon die, so there is no preparation necessary. We just soldered a connection uh, to the backup battery. And then for the laser part, we use a Hamamatsu FEMOS with 1.3 micrometers, and the setup is like this. We have a laser scanner which moves the laser beam over the BB RAM, um, over the key memory, and then at the same time, we measure the current consumption at the backup battery port, and we do this while the FPGA is powered off, so the key memory is only supplied by the backup battery, which we have replaced with this current amplifier, and this then allows us to measure the current consumption during laser stimulation, and we acquire this simultaneously with the scanning process, and then that will give us the 2D uh, map. And now Shine will present the results. Thank you. So now let's take a look first at the 
Xilinx Kintex uh, Ultra Scale chip uh, in its package. So as you can see in the picture, it's a flip chip, as Heiko mentioned. So basically, that means that we have access to the silicon on the backside of the chip directly. So we don't really need to do any polishing or thinning. Which means if you, if you put this flip chip package under our laser scanning microscope with the 1.3 micrometer laser, we directly can get a reflected image like this that the whole dye from the backside and the whole active region is visible to us. So now the question is where we should search for the key. So where is the BB RAM that is our, actually our main target? If you look more closely, you can see that we have a lot of regular structures uh, um, on this die, which are actually related to the configuration logic blocks of the FPGA. And the other, on the bottom part, which we highlighted with the red line, you see some irregular structure. Um, and if you check it with the floor planner in the Xilinx IDE software, you can uh, assume that this, this area is actually related to the configuration logic, uh, which is responsible for decryption, for authentication, and for distributing the beta stream all over the FPGA. Now, let's zoom in this area, and we see this. So um, still, we don't know where the, the memory is, uh, where the memory is, or where the key storage is, where the AES is, and so on. So in this case, we are interested only for the BBRAM. Now we are starting our, our experiment with the laser stimulation, and we take a look to see how this area reacts to our, you know, stimulation experiments. So after stimulating with the with, with the laser. Um, you see that two structures, we highlighted them with yellow color, they are reacting to our stimulation. So basically, what, what we have done, we, the, the laser scanned the, this area, and we, we, we monitored the ch changes in the current on the battery line. And only these two structures, um, when the laser hits these two structures, we see changes on the, on the, power line, on the battery line. Now, let's zoom. So in the first experiment, actually, we set a random key inside the uh, BB RAM, and then we did our laser stimulation experiment. Again, we see these two structures. And then in the second phase, we have uh, deactivated the BB RAM, so the right structure goes off. So, and then, so from this, we understood, OK, the right structure should be uh, the battery background, which we are searching for. And please note that in all of our experiments, the FPGA was powered off. So we just need to stimulate and then measure the current changes on the battery line. Now, uh, let's take a look at the BBRAM itself. So I should mention that this is not a reflected image. Basically, this pattern that you see is the changes on the, current, on, on the battery line, which we mapped to a 2D uh, pattern, right? So it looks like an image, but it's, uh, it's actually the, uh, the, the changes in the, in the current on the power line. And so the bright areas are the areas on, on, on the configuration on, on the in, on, in the BB RAM which are reacting um, to, the, to the laser stimulation. So actually, you see from, uh, still from this pattern, we can see that from geometrical shapes, we can read out the memory content, but we still don't know uh, how the physical address versus logical address looks like on this. So therefore, we did a few experiments. For example, one of them, we, as you see on the right side, we have um, programmed one of the bits of BBRAM to one, and then we shifted it eight times. So and we measured eight times also, and then we created this animation. As you can see, uh, the, the bit is moving from left to the right. Uh, so and we found out that physical addresses and logical address addresses are actually the same on, the, on this device. Um, another experiment, we set all bits of the BBRAM to 1 and 0. And as you can see, so almost all cells are uh, changing. Um, so they, the, the pattern will be changed. Now the question is, is it possible to get a real? I mean, with, with, with our eyes, visually, we can, uh, we can extract the content. But can we do it automatically? And the answer is yes. So basically, what we need to do, um, we need only to have on the bottom a um, reference image where you, you have a BBRAM with a zeroized key, so every bit are set to zero. And then you, you get a pattern from your TLX experiment, which, um, um, which, has, which contains your target key. So, and then what you need to do, uh, you need to subtract them. So we developed um, a Python image processing tool that it does that for us, and automatically, you can uh, 
recover the key. The 256-bit key, which is used for AES to decrypt the bit stream. Now, um, I would like to conclude the talk. I would like to mention that uh, the required effort for the attack development was less than seven hours, which was also surprising to us. It was really low. And I should mention that this attack is not, I mean, this was a case study on Xilinx chips, but this is applicable also to other SRAM based FPGAs like you know, Intel FPGAs, which they use as also BBRAM. In principle, it's, it can be also applied to, uh, to any SRAM, but um, we haven't tried that yet. Um, but for example, if you have, for example, another FPGA with, with SRAM puff or something like that, so it's, in principle, it should work. Um, another thing is that, um, I would, that, that I would like to mention is um, this attack, as you can imagine, is much cheaper than other optical attacks that has been already proposed in literature, like optical contactless probing or like photon emission, which, is make, which, which makes this attack even more threatening. Um, and we should, uh, we should consider it really carefully. So, and the, other, the, the, the third thing is actually, as I mentioned, in all of our experiments, uh, the FPGA was powered off, which means the already implemented side channel countermeasures or the, during configuration or during runtime, they cannot help. So we need to come up with some new solutions, um, which works also when the FPGA or when the chip is powered off. And it should also work actually with, with I mean, the, if we have some countermeasure circuit, it should be able to work with the battery without draining too much power, power from that. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Over the back. Catch. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the excellent talk. Um, just for clarification, um, did I get that correctly? You did not decapsulate? decapsulate? No, we didn't. Um, if you have a modern flip chip device, um, that's also a question we get a lot. Um, this is already the silicon. Oh, okay. So um, it was like that before, like on older CPUs. Uh, maybe some of you remember that. It already looked like this, but I also didn't uh, know for, before I came to this field that this is actually the silicon. And then you just laser engrave your mark, uh, markings into the silicon. And that's why you can actually still see them here. Yeah, OK. Um, and then my other question, isn't your laser spot quite large relatively to the um, uh, structures that you're uh, heating up? Isn't well, that a problem? The, the, this is 20 nanometer technology, but that is also, I think most people who do design know, but 20 nanometer, like a common misconception for people who not do design is 20 nanometer doesn't mean that your transistors are 20 nanometers. The transistors are as large as the designer chooses them to be, and um, that depends on what the transistors have to do. And in this case, um, we have one micron resolution, and the cells are large enough um, to be analyzed with that, although it's um, 20 nanometer technology. So you can see here that's 40 micrometers, so these cells are something like two or three micron um, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. squared. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, because, but that's also a design constraint because this has to be low power. It has to operate on a battery for 10 years. You can't do like minimum size SRAM cells for that because they will leak and then, yeah. So you didn't have any problems that you're heating more than one cell at a given no, time? No, I mean, you can actually, like, these are individual cells, right? Yeah. This is one cell, and you can see that we even have some headroom. OK, OK. Excellent. Thank you. So quick question. Uh, I, I had a question here. So uh, for this particular packaging, you didn't have any thermal interface material on the top to spread the heat. Like normally, you know, in many devices, you will have some kind of a thermal uh, spreader. You mean, uh, uh, you mean like, um, like a heat sink? Yeah. Right? Um, and I guess your question is if that would be a problem if we had that? 
Yeah, yeah. Like we didn't have it in this case because we need to get the laser in, but that is also not a problem because you have to remember when we are doing this attack, the device is completely powered off. So that it can't generate any heat if it's powered off. The only thing that is on is the battery to supply the SRAM. So you're free to remove the heat sink. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Let's thank the speaker again.